Hi everyone. Our town is offering a drive-in service during this coronavirus shutdown, and I was asked to preach this week. Since I had to include not just a sermon, but an opening and closing prayer, I figured I would add those here as well. If you'd like to skip to the sermon, you can jump to the mark of this video. And remember, stay safe, wash your hands, and wear a mask when you go out shopping. Yes, for your own safety, but especially for the safety of others. Join God in saving lives. Hi everyone, my name is Tim Friedel. I'm the new pastor at Wesley United Methodist Church here in Georgetown. I still consider myself a new pastor, both at Wesley and in general. Wesley Church is actually my first ever congregation, and it has not even been a full year since I arrived. One of our traditions at Wesley is to say the Lord's Prayer every week, and typically I have to lead it. Unfortunately, I am always forgetting to do it, no matter how many notes I write down to remind myself. Whenever I say I forgot, people at my church tell me I am too young to start forgetting things. So for the time being, I have resorted to blaming it on first year anxiety. Not sure yet what I will do next year. But today, and honestly any day during this crisis, it seems like a fitting time to say the Lord's Prayer. It is a fitting time to declare God's kingdom will come and his will will be done. It is a fitting time to pray for God to meet our needs, our daily bread. And it is a fitting time to proclaim that God's kingdom, power, and glory will last forever. So before I forget, please join me in praying the prayer our Lord and Savior taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those our trespasses against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In strange times such as these, weird words become commonplace. For example, social distancing. How often did you hear that term before two months ago? I'm not sure I've ever heard of it before. But there's another word that always seems to pop up with such frequency during horrible events. 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, and now coronavirus. That word is hero. During this catastrophe, there are plenty of heroes to point to. I'd point at those working in our grocery stores. They face danger every time they work. But because they are willing to work, the rest of us are able to feed ourselves. Or I'd point at parents. Don't get me wrong, parents are always heroes. But right now, I cannot imagine what it must be like to be with your kids all day, every day, stuck inside the house and telling them they're not allowed to go play with their friends. Heroic. I even saw an article the other day where a group of heroes in Pennsylvania signed up to isolate and sleep at work for 28 straight days so that they could continue making equipment for healthcare workers. And that brings me to those who are the poster children of heroes during this crisis. Healthcare workers. Not enough can be said about healthcare workers, and my gratitude goes out to all of them. The doctors and nurses providing treatment, the receptionists and janitors keeping everything orderly and clean, everyone working in and with the hospitals, and everyone on the front lines of fighting this virus. I appreciate all that they are doing to save lives. Now, these medical heroes, what makes them so heroic to me is the way in which they have adapted to their changing role in the midst of this crisis. As always, they are healers. But add to that this heightened importance of presence. All over the world, people are sick and dying in hospitals while surrounded not by loved ones holding their hands, but by heroic strangers with masks. 
It is our healthcare workers who are currently being there for people during their toughest and darkest moments. And of course, these heroes are taking big risks. They are putting their own health and lives on the line to try and help others. So they are healing, they are present with people suffering, and they are risking their lives. Whether they believe in him or not, they are doing the work of the Lord. They are being the hands and feet of Jesus. Watching them work, that is a sermon in itself. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to end this sermon here. I have a bit of a ways to go. But fortunately, one of my congregants lovingly called me up this week to make sure I knew that I had to keep it to 20 minutes or less. So, with that being said, let's jump into it. Now, our scripture today is going to be the book of Leviticus, the whole book. Of course, we don't have time to read the whole book right now, but how about instead I just connect the dots of how I got from healthcare workers to Leviticus. So our healthcare workers, they have a role, but then built within that role is all these different aspects of the job. Healing, presence, sacrifice, paperwork, and of course, each of them have more roles in their lives than just healthcare worker. They might be parents, sons or daughters, sisters or brothers. And this got me thinking. As Christians, we have a bunch of different roles. One of those roles is as disciples. We are called to study and learn at the feet of our teacher, Jesus. We are supposed to learn from him and mimic what he does. That is a role that we all take part in to varying degrees, but it is at least a role that we know a lot about. But then there are other roles that we don't seem to know nearly as much about. For example, priests. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, it would be easy to skip over that second title, but today we won't. He said, you are a royal priesthood. Now, as I stand here and read this to you, what do you think about that? What do you tend to think of when you hear the word priest? We might think of the high priests and the Sadducees we read about in the Gospels, who we tend to think of as villains in that story. Or you might think of Catholic priests, or even you might just associate the word priest with your pastors. And so already, based on your experiences with other priests, you might have all these ideas in your head, good and bad, about what it means for you to be part of this royal priesthood. Therefore, you can probably relate to the ancient Israelites. In the book of Exodus, we find them living in the land of Egypt, and also living there are Egyptian priests. But then we hear the story of how God rescued them and took them out of Egypt, and he takes them to Mount Sinai, and there, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, God says, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so now, they are probably asking the question a lot of us are asking. What is a priest? Does God mean a priest like those Egyptian priests we saw? And so, in part to answer this question, God gives them the book of Leviticus. Now, the book of Leviticus does a lot of things. It taught the Israelites how to use this tabernacle that they had just finished constructing. It taught them how to be a holy people, living in the presence of a holy God. It even taught them about how to party. But today, we are just going to talk about how it is a book that describes priesthood. It explains what priesthood is like. And a major way it did this was by instructing the Israelite priests on how they should live, what they should wear and not wear, do and not do, and also it instructed them on their role. Being a priest was a missional calling meant to bless others. And as the priests lived and performed their duties according to these instructions, all of Israel would see them. And by watching the priests, the people of Israel got to understand what it means for them to be priests. Pretty much, 
They have their own priest in part so that they can understand how to be a priest to the world around them. And according to the book of Leviticus, this role of priest was fourfold. Oh, and FYI, I learned this teaching from a podcast called Bema. B-E-M-A. So, we have this fourfold role of priesthood. These are four things that a priest did in that ancient culture. And perhaps these are four things that you and I should also be doing as members of this royal priesthood. The first thing is, a priest puts God on display. So one thing you might have noticed today is that I am wearing a robe. There are a variety of reasons why a pastor might wear a robe, only some of which I know. But the reason I'm wearing one today is primarily as a preaching prop. You see, most people do not walk around Delaware wearing robes like this. So I stand out a little bit. And back then, the Israelite priests similarly stood out as they wore robes and all this other garb in the middle of a desert. And this was on purpose. They were supposed to look different. See, they de- see they dress differently because their God is different. And not only did they dress and look different, but they also acted different. And they did different things for most people, all to show and remind people how this God is different from all those other gods. So, how can we put God on display? Surely being parked out here on a Sunday morning is different, but do we follow this up with action and behavior that looks different from the rest of the world? When other people see us, do they see anything different about us? Do they see our loving God and Savior? The second thing is a priest helps people navigate their atonement. The first thing you come across in the book of Leviticus is a series of offerings and sacrifices and a bunch of instructions on how and why to offer them. Involved in all of these were the priests. It was the priest's job to help each person make the sacrifice, helping them to know what to bring and how to offer it correctly. It was also their job to explain what was taking place at the altar, helping people navigate this process that is going to help them cleanse their conscience so that they know that they are okay with God, so that they can leave feeling atoned. And perhaps this is more challenging than the last. How do we help people navigate their atonement? I feel like too often we want to pile guilt onto people rather than helping them cleanse their conscience. I wonder if too many of us are still struggling with our own guilt and this makes us unable and unwilling to help others atone for theirs. The third thing is a priest intercedes on behalf of others. The priest is said to sit in the middle, in the gap between God and Israel, and the priest intercedes in both directions. The priest communicates for God to Israel, and the priest also stands before God and pleads on behalf of the people. God, don't hurt the people. Blot my name out of the book of life, but don't hurt them. In the same way, Israel, and now us, we are asked to stand in the gap between God and the world and to intercede in both directions. As priests, we are tasked with showing the world what God is trying to teach them, to teach all of us. But we are also called to stand before God and plead for God's forgiveness and compassion and generosity on behalf of the world. Once again, I wonder if too often we find ourselves standing in the way, blocking people off and keeping them from God, rather than acting as intercessors who help people come to God. And the fourth thing is a priest distributes resources to those in need. Just like today, back then there were always people who had more than they needed, more than enough. And there were always people who had needs. Who didn't have enough? The haves and the have-nots. In God's economy, the haves were expected to bring their excess to the tabernacle or temple, 
Then the priests took these resources and distributed them according to God's commands. Some of it was supposed to be used internally in the tabernacle and temple. Some of it was supposed to go towards the priests living. And all the rest, all the abundance left over, was supposed to be redistributed to those who have needs. To care for the orphan, the widow, and the alien. How much does this convict us? On the one hand, how much of our excess do we keep? And how much do we give away? I'll be honest, this government stimulus check, some people actually need it, but for me, it is excess, and I need to give it away. But this isn't just about what we give. It's also about what we do with it, and what our churches do with it. Are our churches distributing these resources to those who need them, or are they spending too much of it internally? Is my church significantly aiding the have-nots, or are we too focused on programs for our own members? One of my family members is a health worker. A few weeks ago, I was visiting them and listening in on one of their conference calls. Their leader was reminding them that this is part of what they signed up for. They are essential employees, emergency personnel, and they will be needed at work during this time. Well, I'm here to remind you that this is what you signed up for when you decided to follow Christ. You are a priest. You are called to put God on display for the world to see. You are called to help people navigate their guilt and atonement. You are called to intercede between God and people. And you are called to join in the distribution of resources to those in need, to seek justice and to fight injustice. You are a priest. Now what will you do about it? Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We especially thank you for those people you have sent to be priests for us. Thank you for those who have shown us your love and goodness. Thank you for those who have helped us to know your forgiving nature. Thank you for those who have both taught us your stories and prayed to you for our salvation. And thank you for those who have cared for us and met our needs. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus, our great high priest. Please teach us to follow his example so that we may be your priests for the world. Amen. As we go forth, I hope we all go with confidence that God is calling us to be his priests for the world. But I'm sure we also go with some conviction and trepidation, that fourfold role of priesthood. It isn't easy. It isn't comfortable. It's filled with hardship and pain. At times, it can even be lonely, as not every believer will embrace the role. But if you are willing to embrace it, if you are willing to take it on, please consider reaching out and contacting me. I'm not entirely sure how to be a priest during this quarantine. And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure how to be a priest once this is over. But together, we can wrestle with how to be priests in our own times, places, and situations. Now, let me pray a blessing over us all. Dear Lord, please continue to bless us. Bless our families and other loved ones. Also, bless our heroes. Please keep us safe and healthy, and please show us ways we can join you, Lord, in keeping everyone safe and healthy. In your loving and glorious name we pray. Amen. <laughs>